Hi, my name is Benjamin Hill. I'm a final year student from the University of Wollongong, and I'm here today to talk to you about using a video otoscope in the diagnosis of otitis media. So let's take a look at the anatomy of the normal eardrum using some photos we took with our video otoscope. As you can see, the most prominent feature of the eardrum is called the handle of the malleolus, which is the bone that conducts sound from the eardrum to the brain. The handle of the malleolus points to the front of the ear and towards the top of the head. When describing an abnormality, it's useful to imagine a clock face superimposed over the drum. For example, you can say there is a small one millimeter perforation in the left eardrum at five o'clock. Otitis media usually happens when a child gets a sore throat or a cold and the eustachian tube gets blocked. The eustachian tube usually allows for fluid to drain from behind the eardrum into the throat or back into the nose. If the fluid gets trapped, the eardrum may bulge, and this is known as an effusion, otitis media with effusion, or OME. Other times, the eardrum itself gets infected by those germs, and a child will have an acute otitis media. If a child has many instances of acute otitis media, they can develop a small hole in the eardrum. Remember that this diagnosis is acute otitis media with perforation. CSOM, chronic suppurative otitis media, should only be diagnosed if you know that that hole has been there for two weeks or longer. So now that we've seen some inner ear disease, we're ready to start using our video otoscope. Make sure that your video otoscope is plugged into the computer. In my practice, we use a laptop so that we can take it anywhere, but you can also plug your otoscope into the computer you use every day. First, make sure that you have the right size tip. If you have a child come in, you can use a small pneumatic tip, and if you have an adult coming in, you can use a larger tip. Now, if you want to do pneumatic otoscopy to see how mobile the eardrum is, you can attach a special rubber end. If you don't have a pneumatic ot otoscope, you can sometimes convince older patients to move their eardrums by plugging their nose closing their mouth and trying to breathe out. The patient will feel a sensation like they're popping their ear. Well, you know when you've been in an airplane, have you ever felt your eardrums pop? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna try to do the same thing today. So once I have the scope in your ears, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to hold your nose like you're gonna take a big dive, close your mouth, and try to breathe out against that. Now, if we do the same thing again, mm -hmm. except instead of breathing out, you try to draw air in, you'll feel the eardrums pop back in. Can you give that a try for me today? Now, normally, if someone has an ear effusion, they'll feel that one side will pop, while the side with the effusion will be a lot trickier to move. So next, I would usually explain to the patient, um, in this case, a recently young patient, that we're going to put their ears onto TV. Okay, explain to them that the procedure won't hurt, but it will feel a little bit funny to have something in their ears. Wash your hands. So make sure the otoscope viewer is turned on, that the light on the otoscope itself is turned on. You'll also notice that this otoscope has an automatic focus. The otoscope works best when you line up the green line with the green dot. I like to point the otoscope at my finger and make sure that the fingerprint comes up clearly on the screen. The third and most important feature of the otoscope is the shutter for the camera, which is located at the back of the otoscope with two different buttons. The camera also has a zoom feature, which will amplify any area of the eardrum that you focus on. When examining the ears of a child, you can pull the earlobe straight back in order to straighten out the canal. When working with an adult, pull the eardrum backwards and upwards to get the best view. So once you visualize the eardrum, the patient can perform the Valsalva maneuver. Once you've obtained a clear view of the eardrum, take a photo. 
When you're examining a child, you can easily flip them back and forth to see both ears. Adults, though, will either have to turn around in their seat or switch seats with you. If your view on the camera is occluded by cerumen or earwax, you can ask the patient to go home and soften the earwax with regular vegetable oil or mineral oil or anything they have around the house. They should do this nightly for about a week and then come back to your clinic for irrigation. Earwax is probably the most common obstacle to getting a clear view of the ear. So one of the major differences with a video otoscope is, of course, that it has a camera on it. So you're going to have to hold this piece of equipment a little bit differently than you would a manual otoscope. Now, we're all used to holding our otoscope with the classic pencil grip fashion, but you have to remember that if you're using the otoscope like this, you're going to get a sideways picture coming up on your screen. For that reason, I personally choose to hold the otoscope in an upright position and anchor it against the patient's face with my pinky to ensure that you don't poke them and hurt them. So there seems to be a lot of confusion out there as to what are the most reliable signs and symptoms of otitis media. A recent JAMA evidence review found that ear pain is by far the most accurate indicator of a child with acute otitis media. In terms of signs that you might be able to pick up on otoscopy, the best things to look at are a cloudy membrane and a membrane that isn't moving very well, so an immobile or poorly mobile membrane. If you're having trouble deciding whether a membrane is uh, an eardrum is mobile or not, you can always shore up your hunch with one of these. The tympanometer is a very simple tool which uses a variety of tips and is stuck in the ear to measure directly how mobile the drum is. You can tell patients that the tympanometer will feel funny in their ears, but it definitely won't hurt. So most tympanometers come with a variety of three or four different size tips. You'll know you have the right tip because you get an accurate test result. If your tip is too small, you will get an air leak. In order to use the tympanometer, you have to take a measurement of both ears, even if you think one of the ears is healthy. First, we'll press the L. Then, we press the test. Next, we'll check the right ear. When you've got a good measurement from both ears, place the tympanometer back in its stand. A report will print out and tell you just how mobile or immobile the drum is. Remember that it's common for the tympanometer to say leak one or two times while you adjust the position, but if it keeps saying leak, you've probably picked a tip that's too small. Size up and try again. When you've finished with your tympanometer, remember to remove the tip and place it in a solution of alcohol for sterilization. Remember that if you forget to clean your tips, you run the risk of transferring infections from a sick patient to a healthy patient. Remember that a single case of otitis media isn't going to do any lasting damage, but the kids who suffer, suffer because they get them again and again. I always have educational materials about the disease in my office, and I spend time during the consult to talk to the mothers and fathers about what they can do to prevent otitis media. Simple things like vaccination, blowing your nose, living in a smoke-free environment, and having healthy, nutritious foods can do a lot towards preventing recurrent otitis media. If there are any young family members in the room, I'll usually give them a rubber glove to blow up like a balloon. Not only is this really popular with kids, it'll keep them busy during the consultation, but the actual action of blowing up the balloon blasts open that eustachian tube and helps drain out fluid preventing ear disease from happening. So just remember that your clinical guidelines, your patient education, and fun rewards like stickers and tattoos are available free through the internet at the Care for Kids Ears website.